Ant colonies are often seen as the archetype of a top-down, centralized society. Workers tirelessly build nests, find and gather food, and will even sacrifice themselves to protect the queen and colony. At a glance, it appears that they are all slaves to the queen, who lives in the deepest, best protected part of the nest, and does nothing but eat and have sex, and continuously gives birth to thousands of larva eggs. But the queen lives in permanent darkness, rarely wandering outside of the nest. She has wings, but only flies once in her life. She is well fed, but does not know where the food comes from. She may be notified when threats exist, but does not know how to protect against them. She can hardly navigate the nest that was built for her. Without this knowledge, the queen cannot lead or command the worker ants. Without commands from the queen, ant colonies are poor models of any top-down, centralized society. So what makes ant colonies so successful? When foraging for food, a worker ant leaves behind a trail of scent, or pheromones, to mark her path back to the nest. Others can follow this trail, and it is reinforced as each new ant lays its own scent along the same path. This quickly leads to the familiar sight of hundreds of ants streaming back and forth between the nest and the certified organic non-GMO quinoa chip that you just dropped. If the first ant fails to find any food, her unsuccessful pheromone trail evaporates and is forgotten, superseded by another ant's more productive trail elsewhere. Similar processes are used to build complex nests and protect them from threats. Some nests are built with passive ventilation channels, which regulate temperature and allow fresh air to reach the deepest chambers. Army ants can even form complex structures, such as bridges or protective spheres, out of their own bodies. These emergent processes give the appearance of a collective intelligence within the colony. However, this information is widely distributed, with each ant only aware of a tiny fraction at any given time. In some cases, such as the pheromone trails, information is partially stored in the changes that the ants have made to their own environment. The limited information available to each individual ant means that her success depends upon communication and cooperation with others in the colony. But there is no brain bug drafting up plans for the nest, or for any other aspect of the society. Instead, ant colonies are completely decentralized. They are an archetype of successful anarchy. Ants don't need architects. Needs and resource allocations are communicated from one ant to another through a series of individual interactions using chemical signals. Ants will change roles depending on their individual perceptions of the most urgent needs and most promising opportunities, foraging for food, building the nest, or protecting it from aardvarks. By providing the highest quality and quantity of food, the most successful worker ants decide which of their sister larvae will become future queens. Then the worker ants regurgitate onto them. These anointed few will one day grow wings and fly away to establish their own colonies. This is in contrast to humans who, long after being appointed as politicians, remain slimy pathetic grubs who are incapable of producing any value for society. Like the foraging ant, human entrepreneurs, I mean entrepreneurs, strike out amidst uncertainty in an attempt to discover new sources of wealth. In a market economy, information is stored in the form of prices. These prices are set by consumers at the level that they are willing to pay for each product. If they are willing to pay more for a product than the entrepreneur's cost to produce it, she makes a profit. She, in turn, is willing to pay more for real resources such as land, time, labor, raw materials, and capital goods in order to expand her business and reach new customers.
the successful entrepreneur lays down a path which others can follow. Some may imitate her and become direct competitors. Others may support her as suppliers of the raw goods that feed into her production process. An entire industry can develop seemingly overnight, like the parade of ants who are presently disassembling your certified organic, non-GMO, quinoa chip. However, industries can vanish just as quickly. If consumers are not willing to pay a high enough price to cover her costs, the entrepreneur suffers a loss and is discouraged from pursuing her current path any further. The failed entrepreneur plays a similar, and perhaps more important role, than the successful one. She may have wasted some resources in pursuit of the wrong path, but she and others can learn from her failure. Maybe she will find a better way to bring her idea to market. Maybe someone else will find a better way to bring her idea to market. Maybe others will avoid spending any further resources in pursuit of a similar idea. Individual entrepreneurs work both in competition and collaboration with each other across a wide range of interconnected industries. This process of constant adjustment and adaptation yields a collective discovery of new sources of wealth in the form of new products, more efficient use of resources, and more abundant and diverse goods and services for consumers. It is often said that the consumer is king. But it may be more appropriate to think of consumers as queen ants. They don't need to know how to build a house, how to pave a road, or how to grow certified organic, non-GMO quinoa chips. All they have to do is eat and have sex, and the worldwide colony of entrepreneurs will face the unknown on their behalf. This market discovery process becomes visible in the evolution of a city. Over time, buildings are constructed, demolished, and repurposed. Streets, power lines, and other infrastructure expand to form connections between these buildings. And if you stand at the top of the highest buildings, the people on the streets below look like ants. Ants don't need architects. Do humans? A family might hire an architect to design a house for them. They have specific needs and constraints, which can be understood and accommodated in the design. A responsive architect does not dictate the design. He merely translates the family's needs into a built form. This is a one-size-fits-one solution. But at the larger scale of a neighborhood or city, greater numbers of people introduce more needs, more constraints, and a strong likelihood that some needs will conflict with others. While architects or developers aim to reconcile or mitigate these conflicts, a one-size-fits-all approach is unlikely to make everyone happy. But everyone has to pay. Unlike the ant nest, a human city could be designed by a government planner. The roads form a perfect grid. A certain percentage of area is reserved as public spaces such as parks or plazas. Zoning laws and building codes are enacted, limiting the range of potential land uses. The intent of this design may be to streamline transportation, provide recreation, or prevent potential conflicts over land use. Some of these goals may be achieved. Some may not. But, like the queen ant living in darkness, the city planner can't access all of the required information about ever-changing needs that is distributed among each individual person. Entrepreneurial approaches concentrate risk amongst those who are most willing and able to accept it. Governmental approaches force everyone to accept risk, regardless of who receives the benefit. Markets don't need architects, but governments do. Like the worker ant or human entrepreneur, the government's planner also faces uncertainty, but his risk is borne by the taxpayers who will fund the development of his neo-brutalist Roman amphitheater? By the people who will be displaced to clear land for it? And by the future taxpayers who will eventually fund the repurposing of that amphitheater into a public toilet block? <laughs>
so that drunks will stop covering it with their own trails of pheromone, or whatever that smell is. For every decision the planner makes, we can see the benefits in the form of new buildings, streets, and green spaces. We can see the real costs in terms of man hours, square meters of land, and tons of steel and concrete. But some costs remain unseen. Maybe that plaza with the water feature could have been a hospital. Maybe that industrial zone could have been a wilderness preserve. Maybe that overpass only needed four lanes instead of six. Maybe it needed eight. Maybe that neo-brutalist Roman amphitheater would have better served the public as a toilet block in the first place. Maybe taxpayers would have preferred to spend their money on certified organic non-GMO quinoa chips. Those things aren't cheap. The ant's key to success in an uncertain world is that they are in a constant process of adaptation. Every aspect of their biology and behavior takes advantage of natural selection to quickly converge towards an efficient response to any change in their environment. Adaptation requires failure. Failure creates information. In order to access this information, failures have to be acknowledged. In order to benefit from this information, failures have to be liquidated. But governments are never supposed to fail. When the state controls resources, adaptation happens slowly, if at all. The more control that is exercised, the less information the planners have about the real needs of the people. Under a democracy, various factions endlessly argue over what they think the people really need, while potential projects wait in limbo and keep resources tied up. Under a dictatorship, change can happen more quickly, but the real needs of the people are often ignored altogether. In either case, a decision, once made, is final. It is either the will of the people, or it is the will of our most wise and benevolent glorious leader. Neither democracies nor dictators admit their failures. Both systems are dependent upon maintaining the illusion that someone is in control, knows what is best for the people, and wants what is best for the people. This is the antithesis of adaptation. The sunk costs incurred in making the decision mean that it will not be reconsidered for a long time. Old mistakes are ossified. New paths will not be explored. But if the state doesn't adapt, people will. Even cities with the most restrictive central planning undergo continuous change as individuals find novel ways to repurpose the built environment to meet their needs. Some of these changes may take advantage of the effects of central planning, like a luxury hotel built overlooking a reserved green space. Others may occur in spite of it, like food trucks convening at a plaza featuring a statue of the mayor who enacted the strict inspection laws that drove competing low-cost restaurants out of business. Maybe some of these trucks sell certified organic non-GMO quinoa chips. Architects are often viewed as archetypes of government central planners. They draw up plans and direct the workers throughout the construction process. But like worker ants, the architect's project is designed for a specific, limited purpose. He adapts the design in response to market realities, such as material and labor costs, and to changing needs of his client. The architect is just one of many, laying down pheromones for others to follow. That's what that smell is. Like ants, humans can adapt in concert with our changing environment, but our more complex set of needs demands more diverse solutions. Can any amount of government surveys and statistics come close to the massive amounts of information stored across all individuals? Do the top-down, centralized structures of government empower us to adapt, or do they constrain us from exploring every possibility? If ants can thrive without a king, why can't we? This is ant architecture. I mean, an architecture. <laughs>
Welcome to episode three of An Architecture, exploring the built environment of a stateless society. My name's Joe. I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. And this is Tim. I'm Joe's brother, and I'm an architect living in Boston. In the first two episodes, we described what the built environment is and discussed how government initiates force at various scales of the built environment. In this episode, we're going to talk about anarchic alternatives to services and approaches typically provided by governments. In the last episode, we defined government as an organization which has legitimate authority to initiate force against people without their consent. And we discussed that in excruciating detail to define what each of those terms mean. So the simplest definition for an anarchic society is one where a government doesn't exist. In order for this to come about, at least one of the following three statements would need to be true. The first statement is that there would be no more initiation of force. Of course, that's a goal that's really impossible to achieve. No matter what we do, there will always be some people who will choose to initiate force to meet their ends. However, we can certainly reduce the incentives for initiating force and work towards a society in which there are less situations in which the initiation of force is productive. This means that there would need to be practical alternatives to many of the things that people currently rely on the government for. The second statement is that everyone in the society would consent unanimously to each instance of force that was being committed. It's pretty clear that this is also highly unlikely. Right. For one thing, at least in our current society, there are so many laws that no one could be expected to, to know, let alone consent to all of the laws. In the U.S., the Federal Register, which is the federal government's record of all the laws on the books, grows by thousands and thousands of pages every year. And to expect anybody to try to keep up with that and continually be consenting to all of these new regulations that are foisted upon them is really just absurd. I don't even think the people passing the laws read all of the words that are in there. If you don't know what's being required of you, then nobody can expect you to have consented to it. And besides that, no amount of regulations could put an end to every single conflict in a society. There will always be some people whose ends conflict with the ends of other people's. And so if a certain regulation goes against what one person wants, then they're obviously not going to consent against force being used against them in order to enforce that regulation. In the current system, even if everybody wanted to consent to everything that the government does, it sounds silly just saying it, but let's say that was the case, in our current system there's no means for people expressing that consent or withdrawing consent from government. Frankly, government doesn't care if you consent or not to what they do. They're just going to do what they're going to do, and you're going to love it or leave it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I did leave. I still have to file taxes in the U.S. every year. <laughs> the third statement is that people stop believing that the government's use of force is legitimate. Out of the three statements, this is probably the one that's, that has any chance of a real possibility. In order for people to stop believing that government's initiation of force is legitimate, I think that two things need to happen. The first thing is that you need to have alternative services and solutions in place. It's not like government's going to collapse and then everybody's going to be living in an anarchic utopia. <laughs> the only way that there's going to be some lasting progress for anarchic solutions is if they come about while government is still in existence and start to outcompete government on the market. And so if everybody starts adopting new anarchic approaches and stops using government services, then government becomes completely needless and could be competed out of the market. In the previous episode, we discussed the concept of societal norms where people generally find agreement on certain principles. The example that we used was the appropriate times for noise to be occurring outside where people could hear it within their homes. The legitimacy of government is a similar kind of social norm. So if people begin to recognize government actions as initiation of force or aggression and at the same time realize that that aggression is wrong regardless of how many votes somebody got, then a new social norm could develop where people don't grant government this legitimacy. This second criteria of recognizing government as wrong is important even if practical alternatives to government have been created. Even if there are alternatives, force will always be an easy way out for lazy minds. Not only that, but people who benefit from the use of force may use that force to restrict the capacities of anarchic alternatives. 
When we start to think about anarchic solutions, the idea is that we're simply taking the use of force off the table as a means of achieving any desired end. So where government services are often funded through force and enforced by force, anarchic solutions would have to find other ways to fund themselves and to convince people to comply with whatever regulations they're setting in place. So just to avoid confusion and to better define what anarchism is, at least what it means to us, first we'll discuss what anarchism is not. There are a number of stereotypes out there ranging from guys with bandanas throwing Molotov cocktails at things to Mad Max dystopian sort of things to modern day political situations such as Somalia. The word anarchy is often used as a synonym for chaos, which is exactly what they want you to think. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, the two concepts are very different. At least as we've defined it here, anarchism means something very specific, which is a society in which the initiation of force is not legitimate. Chaos means a general lack of order, trust, or predictability in society. One doesn't necessarily lead to the other. And in fact, you can have plenty of chaos in a society that has a government. Right. When government has the ability to make far-reaching regulations practically at the drop of a hat, this can significantly increase uncertainty for businesses and individuals. One example of this might be every time the Federal Reserve sets interest rates, the stock market goes haywire for a few minutes or hours around just before the announcement is made and then probably goes haywire again in response to the announcement. Another example might be in I'm going to get the dates wrong here, but I think in 1932, if two people were walking down the street and one of them had a bottle of whiskey in his hand and the other one had a gold coin, then the guy with the whiskey would have been thrown in jail and the guy with the gold coin would have been fine. The next year, after Prohibition ended and ownership of gold was prohibited, obviously the guy with the gold would have gone to prison and the guy with the whiskey would have been fine, probably enjoying himself. Right, but it's not the existence of laws themselves that causes uncertainty. And in fact, under anarchy, there would still be laws that apply, or at least rules that everybody accepts, for the most part. The laws or rules or standards that would arise under anarchy would come about more organically and probably more gradually as certain problems arose or certain conflicts arose within the society and were handled by private or non-governmental arbitrators who would also face market forces So under anarchy, you could have businesses or consumer groups negotiating industry standards to find the best approaches to serve everybody's needs. One thing to think about in this anarchic approach to legislation or generating standards is that the standards that would be produced generally would be understandable and accessible to everybody who needs to abide by them. The case we have now where there are thousands and thousands of pages of regulations To me, that is anarchy. I mean, when there's that many laws in the books, then there might as well not be any laws in the books because it becomes impossible to understand them, let alone enforce them. Another point to make about the concept of lawlessness is that it's hard to imagine any society that would tolerate things like murder, theft, fraud, or other forms of blatant aggression. And in an anarchic society, there would be many people who would be motivated to make sure that there are protections against these kinds of offenses and fair means of adjudicating them. So a corollary to this is that anarchy is not about street justice or might makes right. The idea is that protective and judicial services would be provided by individuals or private organizations as opposed to a government which is funded by taxation. This one might be a little hard to wrap your head around. But essentially, it's looking at protection services and justice services like any other service that people could purchase on the market. So these two things are a pretty radical change from the current status quo, and we'll describe them in a little more detail later on in this episode. Anarchism is also not pacifism. The difference is that pacifism excludes any sort of force or violence from being justified or acceptable at all, whereas in the sort of anarchism that we're promoting, defensive force and consensual force are okay, as we discussed in the previous episode. I think we would expect that in an anarchic society that there would on the whole be less use of force, and responses to many problems would probably be more pacifist than they are under a government. 
force would probably generally be seen as a last resort. But again, there are still situations where it would be justified and appropriate. Right, because as we've mentioned before, not every single person is going to just agree to be nice and polite and uh, never cause any trouble. So there will be times when people need to defend themselves against other people who are initiating force against them. But again, if a societal norm has developed where force is seen as a bad thing, which, you know, while it sounds kind of crazy in our modern world, shouldn't really be that ridiculous. For the most part, people would seek nonviolent solutions to problems before they engaged in some sort of force. Another factor driving this is that judicial services would likely become more affordable and less bureaucratic so that people could more easily resolve disputes and be held accountable for their actions. Another point to make is that anarchism is not a complete moral theory. A complete moral theory would address a number of different issues and actions and define whether or not they are right or wrong. When we talk about anarchism, we're just talking about a narrow uh, moral statement about the use of force, which again is that it's wrong to initiate force against people without their consent. There are plenty of other things that people need to consider in their day-to-day life to decide whether their actions are right or wrong. And for the most part, most people day-to-day aren't initiating force and aren't using force. So, so this question of whether or not they use force is really just a small part of the overall moral theory that guides their actions. And so this limitation of the scope of political theory is a pretty important concept that we'll apply a bit later when we discuss some other common ideologies. While political theory prescribes limitations to the means that can be used, it does not determine the ends that people seek. There's also a difference between anarchism and minarchy, which is a political theory that proposes a radically reduced government, maybe one that only provides protection forces or something like national defense, a justice system, and legislation. So one thing to consider about this sort of minarchist approach is that, for one thing, every minarchist has their own idea of what the most important thing is that government needs to provide. There's a bit of an irony or a hypocrisy here, which is that people who think that the state is completely incompetent and corrupt in most things believe that it's the best approach for solving whichever problem they think is most important. And so while reducing the size of government may have benefits for most people in the form of reduced taxes or more freedom of trade or more freedom of action, it really doesn't solve the moral problem that we've discussed, which is that the initiation of force is still happening without people's consent. Another concern about minarchism is that in order for a truly minimal government to exist, The Tooth Fairy would have to be president, Santa Claus would be the vice president, and Congress would be a bunch of unicorns because it's just something that would never, ever actually happen in reality. As soon as you start giving these people the kinds of power that especially large central governments have, they're immediately going to start ramping up that power and will quickly become something other than a minarchy. Don't blame me. I voted for the Easter Bunny. (laughs) (laughs) In the same vein, anarchism is not libertarianism. At least I don't think that libertarianism fully describes what anarchism is. The word libertarianism has come to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people over time. Generally, most people who identify themselves as libertarians do accept the initiation of force as being wrong. This is often called the non-aggression principle. But I think that when we use the word libertarianism, people bring a whole lot of baggage to their understanding of what that means. And libertarianism is closer to a complete moral theory that starts to address things other than simply the initiation of force. And we prefer the term anarchism, which has no baggage whatsoever. <laughs> we don't want to have to go through this whole list again with, uh, with libertarianism. <laughs> yeah. I personally don't mind using the term libertarian as long as I can make it clear what I'm talking about and what my views are there. Yeah, I agree. There's not really a problem with using libertarianism to describe what we're talking about. The point is just that anarchism is really much more specifically focused on this binary question of whether or not the initiation of force is appropriate. Anarchism is also not pro-big business, but at the same time, it's not necessarily anti-big business either. 
really it depends on whether or not the particular business is involved in initiating force against people in some way. So ways that businesses might initiate force against people include something such as polluting someone's property. However, the most common way in which businesses do initiate force is by using government power to drive their own success. And this could manifest in the form of favorable legislation or eminent domain where some land is taken from someone and granted to a, a private entity, enforcement of patents or other forms of intellectual property, as well as corporate subsidies and other corporate welfare programs which are paid for by taxes. And one form of these subsidies might be something as simple as a, a government contract. Some anarchists consider any corporation to be involved in some sort of state-sponsored aggression. And this is because they view privileges such as limited liability protections and bankruptcy protections as a form of essentially government privilege. So we won't dig into that one too deeply because uh, that's a whole rabbit hole in itself. However, in an anarchic society, it's likely that that similar protections could exist for some businesses. The dominant modern political theories are generally described within a left-to-right paradigm. So, for example, in America, you've got liberals on the left and conservatives on the right. And in Australia, you've got labor on the left and liberals on the right. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. That's true, because liberalism, at least in the U.S., classical liberalism used to be... Used to be libertarianism, basically. <laughs> right. <laughs> so around the time of the French Revolution, the people who were in support of the king and maintaining the status quo tended to sit on the right-hand side of the parliament hall, whereas the people who were more radical looking to change things were seated on the left side of the hall. And these days, I guess people who are on the left see themselves as wanting to change things, and uh, people who are on the right see themselves as wanting to keep things the same. Yeah, and I think the kind of change that they were looking for was the status quo that the people on the right were supporting was a system of land ownership, monopoly corporations, and other legal protections or legal privileges granted by the king to a small number of people within the society. The kind of change that the people on the left were seeking was to remove some of these privileges enforced by the king so that more individuals could have land ownership rights or the rights to start businesses, things like that. So generally, that right-left paradigm started as a divide between statists and libertarians. So in modern times, these definitions have changed quite a bit, where the left and right aren't really fighting so much over whether or not the government should have certain powers at all. It's more a matter of fighting over which ends the government should direct its resources to. So, for example, people on the left might support more money going to welfare, whereas people on the right might support more money going to defense. Or corporate welfare. Yeah, well, people on the left support that too. They just don't know it. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I like to think about this left-right spectrum in a little bit of a different way as it relates to statism and anarchism. As Joe mentioned, I think that the left-to-right spectrum can be used to describe the ends that people want to achieve. But then we could also think about putting another dimension on that scale, which might be an up and down axis that indicates the means of the use of force. So if you plot somebody's position on a particular issue on this chart, again, the end that they want to seek might be somewhere on the left to right scale. And the means they want to use to achieve that end could be on the up and down scale, where up might mean that they approve of the use of force and down would mean that they reject the use of force as a means of achieving whatever end they want to achieve. Which one's the axis of evil? <laughs> that's the Z direction. That's the Z axis. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one that's coming right out the page towards you. It's coming right at you. And so this definition of the means and ends axes sets up four quadrants that we can use to consider some examples. So let's say that there's a new natural gas pipeline that's being proposed. So someone who's on the right, who's a statist, might say that it's good for the economy, it's going to create a lot of jobs, it's going to enable people to get cheaper oil or gas or whatever it is. And so they might be in favor of something like eminent domain to ensure that the pipeline achieves its most optimal route and is the lowest cost and is able to be built efficiently. In contrast to that, 
you'd have a left statist who might say that the pipeline is dangerous because there's a threat of a spill or a uh, gas leak. It could be bad for the environment because they have to cut down a lot of trees. They might threaten some rare endangered species somewhere. And so what someone who's on the left, who's a statist, might say that some sort of government regulatory agency should deny any permits to the company who's trying to build this thing and should prohibit its construction because apparently they would prefer to have all that oil come inefficiently in trucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> so in contrast to these, we would have someone who's on the right who is more of an anarchist who agrees that this project would be good for the economy, good for jobs. However, they would be opposed to something such as eminent domain. And the right anarchist would argue that the company who's building this thing uh, is solely responsible for either purchasing land on the market or otherwise incentivizing people through any nonviolent means to agree to allow them to build this thing. And the fourth quadrant would be a left anarchist who agrees, again, that the pipeline is would be dangerous, possibly threatening the environment. However, rather than relying on government force to prevent this thing from going ahead, they might do some sort of grassroots campaign to to go to all the property owners who are on the path of this thing and inform them of the potential risks to their property and encourage them to essentially raise the price on what it's going to cost this company to access their land. Either that or they could ensure that the property owners demand some sort of proper performance bond or, or um, I don't know, an environmental security bond or something like that to ensure that if something does go wrong, there's money there in order to provide sufficient funds for a cleanup. Another example that kind of turns the tables on the example Joe just gave is let's say that there's a group of people who want to preserve a large area of land as undeveloped. So maybe they want to make it a large, a large park or a wildlife preserve or something. You could have someone on the right who's a statist say that this is bad for the economy. This land should be developed um, in order to create jobs and economic opportunity for people in the community. And again, as a statist, they might say that this town or city or state or whoever should use zoning laws to define productive uses of that land, or possibly even use eminent domain to take ownership of the land and then resell it to people who are going to develop it. A person on the left who's a statist might support preserving this land, saying that preserving the land is good for the environment, good for recreation and good for the habitat of uh, the, I don't know, endangered golden-crested warbler or something. <laughs> I made that up as a, as a kind of a joke bird, but it actually is like a bird. Like, I think any bird name that you make up and look up on Wikipedia, like there's actually a bird out there that, that has that name. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably endangered. It's probably in my backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, the left statist wants to preserve the land. And as far as the means of preserving the land, they might say that the government should take the land by eminent domain and zone it to prohibit any future development. So then a left anarchist might agree with that left status that preserving the land is good for the environment, for recreation, and the habitat of golden, what did I say? Golden crested warbler? Golden crested warbler. They're delicious, by the way. <laughs> That's going to be the mascot of our podcast. <laughs> But as far as for the left anarchists, the means that they might pursue in order to achieve this uh, would be to convince landowners, people who own this large area of land, to create a deed restriction prohibiting development or to work with an organization such as a land trust to purchase the land and agree to preserve it into in perpetuity, I guess. What's a deed restriction? So that might be the deed to your house that if, uh, or not to your house, but the deed to any land that if you sell that land to somebody else, then when they purchase the land, they agree to certain conditions within the deed that you're selling them. Got it. So one of the conditions might be, I'm going to buy this land, but I'm not going to develop it for 100 years or 25 years or whatever, you know? Yep. Assuming that the, the landowner agrees with this intent, then they would make sure that they would not sell the land to somebody who did not agree to respect their deed restriction. And again, the last quadrant here would be someone on the right who's an anarchist. They might agree with a right statist that preserving this land is bad for the economy because, again, they'd like to see more development and jobs come into the area. However, they're not going to rely on zoning laws or eminent domain to try to 
get this land developed. Rather, they would try to convince the landowner uh, or landowners to allow the land to be developed or work with an organization to purchase the land for development. So again, the difference here is for the statists, their first inclination is to use government power to achieve whatever end they want to achieve. Whereas with the anarchists, they're not going to rely on the government and instead look for alternative means to persuade the people who have control over the situation to resolve it in the way that they approve of. So they're relying on persuasion and incentivization rather than force. Probably a reaction that most people would have to this sort of example is that the anarchist solutions sound really hard or maybe uh, unworkable. So if you've got to go and canvas a thousand mile long pipeline route and you know meet everybody in that area, and not only that, but then you've got to sell them on the idea of, of all these threats to their land in the face of some big oil company who's you know, waving checks in front of them. Yeah, it, it does sound pretty hard. However, with modern technologies such as social networking and all that, it's getting a, a lot easier to raise awareness of these sorts of issues. And really, if you think about Joe, Joe mentioned, you know, canvassing thousands of miles, let's say, to stop a pipeline. You really only need to get a small amount of people along that route to agree not to sell their land in order to break the line or break the direction of the pipeline that they want to run. You know, it's not that you need to get every single person along the proposed route to, to disagree with it. And generally, when if someone's running a pipeline, they're going to test multiple routes anyways um, until they can find one where they can get everybody to agree. If the oil company can do all the legwork to try to purchase the land, that's actually a lot more work than just trying to go out and convince a handful of people not to sell the land. The more you can get the, these people communicating with each other, then the more that they can sort of bid up the value of their land to the oil company. If a certain number of them all re refuse to sell unless the price goes to a certain point, then they might be able to essentially bid up the cost of the pipeline to the point where it just doesn't become feasible anymore. And so without having to get everybody on the route to agree to prevent the pipeline from occurring, they could essentially achieve the end they're looking for. To sum up these examples, statists on the right or the left might agree on certain means of achieving their ends, such as using eminent domain or zoning or other uh, governmental powers. But of course, they're going to disagree on what those ends are that they're trying to achieve. But they don't see anything wrong with, again, with the means used to achieve them. Whereas an anarchist, again, on the right or the left, might use similar means, such as persuasion and creating market incentives. But an anarchist on either side would, would certainly reject the initiation of force that's represented in uh, government powers. Just to avoid any confusion, uh, we're not saying that people on the right don't care about the environment at all and people on the left don't care about the economy at all. But the difference between the, the left and the right in these examples is really one more of priorities, where the, the person on the right thinks that the economy is more important than the risk to the environments, or at least maybe they don't feel that the risk to the environments are, are that much of a threat, whereas the person on the left does feel that those risks to the environment are, are a threat and, of course, may have an impact on the economy as well. The situation in any real-world example is going to be much more complex than this, but hopefully these examples have helped to sort of illustrate the differences in these kind of four quadrants of this uh, means and ends chart. <laughs> To further outline some potential anarchic alternatives to services that are currently provided by government, we're going to revisit our dreaded scales uh, framework here and go back through each of the scales and talk about, again, some alternative solutions that we can apply to each of these scales of the built environment. And we promise this is the last time we're hitting this thing. <laughs> the first scale we said is your immediate environment or maybe the room you're in. As we said in the last episode, if we're talking about just you as an individual in this space, then there's really no initiation of force going on. You're a free man, baby. <laughs> Whatever you do in your own room is uh, it's up to you. <laughs> we just don't, just don't tell us about it. We don't want to know. Yeah, we don't want to know. <laughs> Keep the emails to yourself and the videos. Stop sending the videos. <laughs> <laughs> but that all changes when you expand out to the scale of the house, when you might have your whole family there, especially if you're married, and especially if you've got young kids, uh, you are very far from a free man. <laughs> Although that is a voluntary relationship. <laughs> Good thing our wives aren't going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> and your family life, for the most part, 
there's probably not a lot of force that happens. We're assuming that you're not some sort of you know, domestic abuser or something like that. Of course, there's a lot of controversy these days around things like spanking kids, which of course is, is a form of violence, a form of force. And even, even some things like threatening a kid or, or yelling at a kid to the point where the kid is you know, scared by this much larger person who's uh, pretty much the, the most important person in their life screaming at them. That could be seen as a, a form of force as well. So there are conflicts that arise in family life. And uh, for the most part, you aren't going to use forceful solutions to try to solve these problems. Because for one thing, using any sort of force against your family is going to destroy any sort of real relationships you have. And it's also tends to become less and less effective over time because you have destroyed that relationship. So just as an example, let's say that you're, uh, you've got a, a five-year-old kid who's um, taking his two-year-old brother and throwing him off the couch, which is, of course, a form of force which needs to be stopped, except that it is voluntary because the two-year-old is laughing his ass off and just loving it until it all goes horribly wrong. So, of course, the first inclination of most people is to let him have it, scream at him, get, you know, get off the couch, quit doing that. But of course, you know, as most parents know, kids don't even listen to that. You know, they'll, they'll just keep doing it. So then you might have to escalate the situation and go and, and physically pick up one or the other of them and, and physically separate them. But again, this is kind of a, a forceful situation. You know, it's not necessarily the, uh, the most peaceful or I guess anarchistic way to approach it. So something else that you might do is offer some sort of alternative activity that they can be doing. Like, hey, if you guys are going to be bouncing around, why don't we go out and jump on the trampoline? Um, where at least then it's more of a controlled situation and there's less risk of someone getting hurt. So that example of finding an alternative to force to resolve or persuade somebody, in this case your kids, to act differently than, than the way that they want to act in the current moment is really no different than what we're going to be talking about at larger scales. Another thing to think about at the scale of the house or your family is how to keep your family from needing to rely on government services that do exist out there. So for example, to keep yourself from relying on things like welfare or social security, you would want to try to build your own wealth and save money for the future so that you'll hopefully have the means to maintain your standard of living in the event that you lose a job or that you know have some some medical crisis or something that where you have a lot of expenses. Of course, buying appropriate forms of insurance is another means of providing this kind of security. But we did say we weren't going to talk about insurance companies, right? <laughs> yeah. <in> episode one. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, we're getting there. <laughs> Along those same lines, thinking about disaster preparedness. So, you know, wherever you live, whether it's in New England and you're worried about snowstorms that can bury you for a week or Australia and you're worried about bushfires. Almost anywhere you live, there's a, a potential of some you know, horrible natural disaster that could affect your house or your home. Coming up with ways to prepare yourself and protect yourself and your property from those types of events is important to then be able to say no to governmental solutions. One distinction we should make when we talk about disaster preparedness is that uh, you don't necessarily have to be completely self-sufficient in order to be prepared for unexpected events, such as some natural disaster or maybe even a war or something like that. I think that thinking about the term resilience is more appropriate than necessarily trying to be completely self-sufficient. Resilience just suggests more that you, know, you could be relying on others to help you in these types of situations, but it's about having those systems and networks in place so that you are prepared to respond if something threatens you or your property. So now we're considering the scale of your property. In episode two, we discussed a few various threats that could occur at this scale, such as a burglar or a trespasser coming onto your property and threatening you or your family. So now we'll consider some anarchic approaches to protecting your property against these sorts of threats. There are some obvious ways which everyone has already implemented for the most part, um, such as having locks on your doors, a fence around your property, maybe a security system, or maybe what some people regard to be the, the best way to protect your property, which is a guard dog. Not one of those ridiculous little yappy things. <laughs> It'll just annoy people away. <laughs> I don't want to hear this. Next house. <laughs> or you could just blast our podcast out your window whenever you're not home, and no one will come close. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when we think about making your home or building architecturally secure, 
there are a lot of different degrees of security that you can can build into your house or really any building. There are a whole variety of locks and other kind of products out there that you can use to add different degrees of, of security to your doors. Um, similarly with your windows, you know, obviously it's, it's not that hard to break glass <laughs> and come into your house that way. But again, if you want to take it to that level, there is impact resisting glass out there and windows that can provide higher level of security. If you think about a building like a bank, um, most people know or believe that those buildings are fairly architecturally secure so that whatever they're keeping in there is going to be protected from somebody breaking into the building. And even if someone does get into the building, they probably have a vault that is really the ultimate in architectural security. It's a big metal door with a big lock on it. Now, obviously, most people aren't going to go to that level with the security for their house. But if we think about trying to find ways to, to avoid getting into a situation where you're being threatened with force, and then in return, let's say, calling the police and having them come to your house and get into a situation where they might be initiating force, then making your home architecturally secure might be a way to reduce these potential risks of force and deter any potential threats. There are also various forms of security systems that you could install, ranging from a simple intrusion detection or motion sensor up to something like a closed circuit TV system. Well, some security systems are wired up to call the police in the event of any potential threat. In this sort of anarchic ideal that we're discussing, the security system should be sufficient enough to deter the crime in itself. Because after all, even if the burglar sets off the alarm, he knows that he's probably got at least 10 or 15 minutes before the police show up. And one thing we'll talk about in a little bit is alternatives to police protection. So you could have your security system notifying a private protection force if you're contracted with one. But even the presence of a security system might be enough to deter most criminals from attacking your house specifically. You can even get stickers that say that your house is protected by a security system even if you don't have one and stick those on your window. And that'll probably do the job just as well as most normal security systems would do in, in terms of deterring people. The scale of the neighborhood is significant for the sorts of approaches that we're discussing throughout this podcast. The reason for this is that it's a scale where you're interacting with other people, but at the same time, it's a small enough scale that any individual can have a visible impact. One example we gave in episode two of an issue that could come up at the scale of the neighborhood is noise disturbances. The example we gave was a, uh, a teenager throwing a party and making too much noise at two o'clock in the morning. The governmental solution to that problem that we presented in episode two was that, you know, someone could just call the cops and then they would go and break up the party and problem solved. But if we want to think about anarchic solutions to a problem like this, where we're not willing to rely on force or a threat of force, which the police can represent, then there are a number of other things that we could consider. Obviously, you could go over there yourself and just talk to them and try to get them to understand and appreciate the problem that they're causing for you and their other neighbors. And often, even if they are just made aware that somebody is paying attention to what they're doing and is affected by it, that alone may be enough to persuade them to, to quiet down a bit. And again, taking it to another level, as we said uh, when talking about the property scale, you know, you can look within your own sphere of influence, which is your own property, and find ways to make your own home more acoustically sound so that any of those types of disturbances wouldn't have as much of an effect on you. In that way, it prevents this from ever becoming a problem in the first place. And so noise is a problem that could affect multiple people in your neighborhood. Which brings us to the question, who are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet each day. <laughs> not, not in my neighborhood. I'm, <laughs> I'm too antisocial for that. <laughs> And so as we've said before, these anarchic solutions can seem to be more difficult or unworkable compared to going to someone's house and pointing a gun at them. However, since these approaches are based on interacting with your neighbors and coming to beneficial solutions for both parties, they can foster the building of stronger community and better understandings between you and your neighbors. And of course, nobody likes having the cops show up at their door. So if that's your first approach to try to solve a problem, then it's going to breed resentment amongst your neighbors 
whether or not they knew it was you that called, then if it was some sort of anonymous tip, then they might be suspicious of everyone on the street. So you can see how the governmental approach to solving this sort of a problem breeds resentment and animosity and misunderstanding, where the anarchic solution actually can help you to form better relationships with your neighbors. Now, let's say that there is a situation where there really is a real problem. In an anarchic society, there would be means and services for investigating and prosecuting those types of things. And we'll get into that in a little more detail in one of the next scales. So at the level of the neighborhood, you have some resources which are in common use by multiple people, such as the roads. You might have a park near your house. Typically, these are provided by the state. However, they don't necessarily have to be. We'll come back to the roads issue in a little bit. But if you think of something like a public park, uh, there are plenty of examples of privately owned public parks or public playgrounds that could be owned by some kind of a trust or some kind of nonprofit organization. Or oftentimes, corporations may even sponsor or construct parks or ball fields or playgrounds or things like that, either on their property or in the community as a show of goodwill or, or a show of their involvement in the community. Or even you might have developers who, who build a whole housing development and in order to attract people to buy houses there, they'll set up some attractive common areas, parks and maybe ponds and that sort of thing. That's because these developers recognize that people who would want to live in these houses value having these sorts of amenities accessible to them. And this in turn raises the property value of all the houses in their development. Right. And so, you know, there may be a preconception out there that if it weren't for the government or government parks, that there wouldn't be any green space and, you know, all the land would be gobbled up by greedy developers. But the reality is that people do want parks and outdoor space and ball fields and all that good stuff. And so whenever there's a demand for something, there's a market solution to meeting that demand. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's going to be profitable for somebody. But as I said, there are plenty of examples out there of non-governmental preservation of parks and open space. Right. And people tend to look around at their neighborhoods and assume that whatever the amount of green space that's there is the correct amount, just because it's what they're used to, what they see every day. However, there's, there's nothing to say that under purely private development, uh, without the government being involved, that there wouldn't be necessarily even more green space or, or more of these sorts of parks and amenities available to people. One thing to think about here is, similar to what we were talking about with schools, uh, with government parks and government playgrounds, there's zero cost to anybody to use these parks and playgrounds. And so it creates a situation, again, where they're really out-competing any private parks or playgrounds on the cost of using them. And that's not to say that everybody should have to pay to go use a park, but I think that if government weren't necessarily providing all these parks and playgrounds, that people might come up with more creative ways to fund and support the preservation of parks. And look, I mean, parks, once you build them, they don't cost a whole lot. <laughs> Everyone in the town pays taxes, which might be used to build a park in one particular neighborhood. Now, depending on which neighborhoods these parks are built in, this could end up being essentially a subsidy from the poor to the rich where the park raises the property value for the rich people and they get the benefit of it, but the poor people are still paying through it via whatever taxes they're paying. And so, of course, beyond building parks, there are other interpersonal conflicts that can arise. But again, if you're a normal person, you're not going to go out and threaten your neighbor with force in order to get them to stop doing something or to chip in to help shovel the snow off the sidewalks. So there are a few nonviolent methods that people can use to put pressure on people or to, to try to influence them or persuade them in order to achieve a beneficial outcome for everyone involved. So another example of a conflict that could arise in the neighborhood has to do with trash removal. Now, an anarchic solution to trash removal is for each person on the street to make their own arrangements for someone to come and pick up their trash. Now, there's a good chance that you could get some sort of a deal by getting a bunch of people to agree to take the trash out on the same day and subscribe to the same service. You know, maybe you get some sort of a group discount or something like that. Effectively, on a, on a large scale, that's, a, that's essentially the way it works under the monopolized state service. The main difference here is that you would actually have some competition between different providers of trash removal services that could allow you to lower costs. However, under a system like this, 
There could be one or two people on the street who just don't care about having trash pile up on their yard. You know, there's some sort of hoarder or something like that. And their yard just turns into a junkyard. So this could become a nuisance to you and most likely all of your neighbors who have to walk by or drive by this guy's yard. Maybe he lives right across the street for you and you have to see it every time you look out the window. Not to mention that it could affect the property value of all the houses on your street. One thing that's worth noting before I move on is that even when there is public trash removal service, there are still people who do this sort of thing and have trash strewn all over their yards. So the fact that a service is provided by the state doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to use it. There are a couple of anarchic approaches that you could take to this sort of a problem. One would be for you and several of your neighbors to chip in and essentially pay this guy's subscription fee to have your trash company go and pick up his trash every week. Now, of course, this is imposing a cost on you, but at the end of the day, it may be something that you feel is worthwhile doing. Another approach you could take is to organize for you and several of your neighbors to set up some sort of a working bee where you go over to his house and clean up his yard on a Saturday afternoon or something. And this could even be expanded out to some sort of a program where every other weekend you pick a different house in the neighborhood and you go and do some do a working bee and get a lot of yard work done and gardening or whatever. So this is something where there's not really much of a direct financial cost. Uh, there is a cost in terms of people's time, but it's an activity that can really build relationships among the whole neighborhood as well as making the whole neighborhood look nicer and maybe raising your property values. If these more cooperative type of solutions don't necessarily appeal to you, of course, there are other ways to reduce the impact of somebody having trash all over the yard. Something you could do architecturally is to put up fences. So the neighbors on either side of this guy's yard could put up fences. That leaves the view from the road open for the person across the street. But in an anarchic society, somebody or an organization would own that road, and they too would probably be concerned or wouldn't like the fact that this person has trash all over the yard. There's really nothing to stop the owner of the road from putting up a fence at the front of this person's property as well. That way everybody else is just boxing them in and they don't have to see the mess. This is a little more of an antagonistic kind of scorched earth policy, but again, it, it gets the job done without initiating force. Yeah, something that's pretty common in Australia is for people to have a row of some sort of tall trees or shrubs or bushes or something like that, which line the edge of their property. Hmm. And this provides a privacy screen as well as gives you a little bit of extra green in your yard. Yeah, that's like in, in England they do that too. There's hedgerows that kind of divide up everybody's property and also divide them from the street. So you drive down the streets in England and there's just like a wall of green on either side. <laughs> to sum that up, if you're having a problem with your neighbor's property, the answer is shrubbery. <laughs> Another thing we had discussed in the last episode at the scale of the neighborhood was the use of zoning regulations to govern things like, you know, what color people can paint their houses or, or what they can put on their front lawn, things like that. And so it's worth noting that there are plenty of examples out there of communities where these restrictions are established on a voluntary basis. Essentially, any condominium development that you move into has a set of rules and regulations that govern what people can do to their house, uh, what they can put in their yard. There are lots of different kinds of condo developments out there with varying degrees of restrictions on um, the use and development of the property within the neighborhood. So if you're somebody who wants to move into a place that doesn't have garden gnomes and doesn't have political signs and all the houses are painted within a certain range of colors, there's a condo out there for you. We've joked around about the whole love it or leave it thing, and this kind of sounds a little bit like love it or leave it. However, one key difference here is that we're talking about a pretty small scale. Within a relatively small neighborhood, you could have different streets that each have different rules. So it's not like you need to move away from your family and your job and everything just to achieve the sort of rules or aesthetics that you're looking for. Condo developments often restrict the use of political signs on your yard or uh, certain kinds of flags hanging from your windows. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you what the solution to this in an anarchic society is. Of course, there are no political flags, there are no political signs, so that problem's solved. Win. <laughs> Anarchy won. Government, nothing. Just the fact that condo associations would prohibit certain political signs and political flags from being displayed on the yard 
is sort of an illustration of the division and antagonism that having some sort of a one-size-fits-all government creates. Essentially what happens is that everybody is forced into some sort of agreement on something, whether or not they actually agree on it. These governmental approaches force people into a position where they have to argue with each other because they're not in a position where they're able to make their own decisions and choose whatever option is best for them. So, for example, you don't get pissed off at your neighbor just because he uses Verizon while you use Comcast. What happens is that you get pissed off at Comcast because they're a monopoly and they provide crap service. Just like the government. Let's move on from the scale of the neighborhood and talk about the next scale of the metropolis, or the city. One thing that happens at the scale of the metropolis is the provision of a variety of services by the government. But all of these services could be provided without government taxation and government intervention in the market. One objection to anarchism that's so common that it's, it's become kind of a cliche among anarchists is this question of who will build the roads if we don't have a government. That's really not a question of who will build the roads. Actually, even government roads are usually built by private contractors who bid for the work. And in a lot of cases, the roads are even maintained by private contractors in some capacity or another. If at all. <laughs> right, if at all. It's really a question of who will fund the roads and who has responsibility uh, as a property owner of those roads. And also who decides how the roads get laid out and how the property for the road is acquired. Right. As far as building new roads, we talked previously about this idea of trying to bring a pipeline through people's properties. With the desire to build a new road, you could have a similar approach, and in fact it is a similar approach when the government does it, which is they lay out a path and then they go out and, and try to acquire the property or easements that are needed to start constructing that road. Now, governments often use eminent domain in order to get the property that they want, but as we mentioned previously, it's conceivable that someone who wants to put in a road or a pipeline or some other utility could use strategies of exploring multiple paths and negotiating with landowners to locate the road in a way that makes property owners whole. And it could be that the developer who wants to build the road is unable to convince all of the landowners along the path to allow him to build the road. And what this demonstrates is that those landowners envision a higher value for their land than what the developer is willing to pay them. And in this way, a collective decision is being made. However, it's not being made by some sort of electoral vote process. It's made simply by a market process of ownership and trade, or the lack thereof. So with this market-based process, it's really only the people who would be directly affected by the development of the road who are involved in making the decision as to whether or not it actually happens. While there may be other people who would potentially benefit from the road's creation, those people aren't showing that they're willing enough to pay whatever fees are required in order to make the road viable. The result of this process could be that it becomes more expensive to build a new road than it currently might be with governments building roads. So at first, that might seem to be a bad thing. But again, the point here is that in an anarchic world, the cost of building the road is more closely aligned with the demand for that road. So it could be the case that, you know, maybe there are too many roads now. Of course, since it's free to drive on the roads, there's no market feedback mechanism that tells government how many roads there should be or how much they should spend on roads. The only real feedback is the amount of traffic of everybody using the roads for free. And so a corollary to this is that if roads are less viable because they're more expensive, then there may be other means of transportation that become more viable in comparison. For example, public transportation systems might become more competitive, or people might be more prone to ride bikes, so you might get more bike trails which are cheaper to build. Or of course, the real solution to everybody's transportation problems, which is flying cars. That's correct, which you're gonna need anyways to get over all that shrubbery. <laughs> If we think about the bigger impact of creating market pricing for roads, we've been assuming that that might mean there are less roads. It might, in fact, mean that there are more roads if that's what everybody wants. I mean, right now, there are plenty of places that have terrible traffic, and so you could imagine people in those areas being very supportive of new roads being constructed or expanded. 
But one other effect of all of this road construction is a phenomenon we have, especially in the United States, and it's becoming more and more common around the world, which is sprawl, where you have development focused around the automobile that spreads out in every direction, making cities and towns and neighborhoods that you need a car to get around. So if you're somebody who's opposed to sprawl, you should be an anarchist. Yeah, we've all got flying cars. Anarchists have flying cars. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Of course, the question we posed but haven't answered yet is who will pay for the roads or who will fund the construction of the roads and maintenance? If you think about how a private road would be funded without taxation or without any gas taxes or anything like that, the obvious first answer is some sort of tolls. And given the experience of existing toll booths, especially if you drive down somewhere like the Jersey, was it the Jersey Pike that's got like a you pay 10 cents every two miles or something like that. Yeah, right. Which, by the way, is a government road. It's a huge inconvenience for, for people to try to get around. So I, I think it's pretty safe to say that if someone was building a private road, especially with modern technology, they'd find a, a pretty good way to get people to pay for it via some sort of subscription or a pay-as-you-go kind of service. It's likely that there would be a whole bunch of different commercial models that you could subscribe to in order to get your access to the roads, depending on how often you would use them or, or at what times of day you use them. Yeah, and there are plenty of examples, again, of privately owned roads. We talked previously about condo developments, where within the development, you could have a number of roads going to everybody's houses, which are owned by the condominium trust. So in any given area, the property owners might want to have a stake in owning the road. In that case, it, it might be that they don't feel the need to charge people for use of that road because they want to be able to just come and go as they please and have their friends and family come and go as they please on the roads. Or if it's a commercial area, the businesses along those roads want the customers to come to their businesses without having to pay to get on and off the roads. So there could be any number of models that develop where the properties who are benefiting from the existence of the roads could own or at least fund the roads themselves, and that way those roads would still be free for everybody else to use. And so it's likely that we'll do a whole show about roads at some point um, because it is a pretty interesting topic and it's certainly a relevant topic when we're considering the built environment. In addition to roads, there are a number of other services that are typically provided at the level of the city. These include, as we've already discussed, trash removal as well as wastewater removal or sewage treatment as well as something like street lighting. However, as we discussed previously with trash removal, there are other non-governmental ways to provide these kinds of services. For a sewage system, you could have a local septic system just in your yard. Or, again, there could be some company that comes in and sells everybody on the idea that uh, getting poo away from your house is a good thing to do. Probably not a hard sell. Good luck with that. Likewise, with street lighting, it's obviously something that, that everyone likes. And it's realistically probably not something that costs too much to provide. And so if you think outside the box a little bit, even something that's considered to be some sort of a public good can typically find a market solution. One concern with public services being provided by private companies might be that they could become a monopoly. So for example, if everybody owns the roads in one town, then that could be a problem or if there's only one sewage treatment plant in town or there's only one trash removal service, then yeah, there would be a monopoly within that town. But as long as it was a market service and people weren't forced to pay for that company alone, there's always a potential that another company could come in and develop a competing service if that company isn't serving their customer as well. So whether or not somebody actually does come in and create a competing service, just that threat of the possibility of someone coming in and competing with them could help to keep that service provider in check so that they're not charging too much and they're maintaining their systems and still providing a good value to their customers. Right, and in many cases, there are competing technologies that could also come into play. For example, if you've got one sewage treatment plant in town, people could install individual septic systems as well in their own backyards and be off the grid. And similar with water supply or water service, people could put wells in on their own property if they don't want to pay for the water services provided by the town. Right, or rainwater tanks, or truck in bottled water. Right. I mean, the, the point is that there's a point at which other technologies become more viable or more competitive, 
Another service typically provided at the scale of the metropolis by governments is police or security forces. We've touched on this a bit, but there's really no reason why why a police force or security force needs to be funded by taxation. Most people want to have somebody that they can call in the case of an emergency or a threat. And it's not hard to imagine that these services would develop either as businesses or as community organizations within an anarchic society. So one example of this is simply a neighborhood watch program where people from a neighborhood get together and go around and patrol their streets at night or whatever and just try to keep a presence in the neighborhood so that it becomes less desirable as a target for criminals. One potential model that could eventuate under private police services would be, and it's the same goes for something like a private fire service, would be something like if a crime happens, if you call the cops, then there would be multiple security companies who would be competing for your business. So you could have some sort of a subscription with a particular company, or you could have some sort of a pay-as-you-go thing where effectively the first guy to show up on the scene is the one who gets the job. Either that or the first guy who actually catches the criminal is the only one who gets paid. So systems like this could turn out to be more effective than the current systems where it's very bureaucratic. And I'm sure even a lot of the cops who are out on the beat trying to do the right thing get discouraged after a while because they simply don't have the right resources or... Or they're required to go and and prosecute crimes that aren't really crimes, like, you know, people smoking weed or whatever. It's, you know, they're put in a position where they become antagonistic to the neighborhoods that they're patrolling because they're enforcing unjust laws in a lot of situations. When you think of things like drug crimes, often local police departments get a lot of funding to go after drug users or people selling drugs. And so that takes them away from what most people might consider to be the real crimes within their neighborhoods. This concept Joe mentioned of having a police force that might respond to a call. It's funny, last night I was staying in a small town where one of my projects is, and about three o'clock in the morning, we hear this god-awful siren going off. And it sounded like, you know, like an air raid siren or something, or, or like a really loud uh, fire truck. The next morning, actually, we heard it again. It turns out it was a, a fire alarm, or somebody had called in a fire, And then they sound this alarm to call all the volunteer firefighters to come to the police station so that they can go and put the fire out. So that's a very old technology that allows for this type of uh, community fire service. You could imagine a similar thing for a police service. Not that they should be blowing sirens every time somebody calls the cops, but luckily we've moved on beyond that uh, technology for communication services these days. So. (laughs) Oh, we still have we have those sort of things in Australia too. They have the CFS, which is I think County Fire Service or something like that. And um, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. It's when, whenever there's a bushfire, they blow a big horn. Out, well, when I was living up in the hills, you, you could hear it every now and then. And uh, yeah, and it's all volunteer firefighters who go and do it. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there are certainly precedents for these types of services, especially in smaller towns or or more kind of rural areas where. You don't necessarily have the density to support a concentrated fire service or police force. You might just have volunteer firefighters or, uh, you know, maybe there's one sheriff and he has volunteer deputies who come in and in the event that they need more manpower. So those are kind of community solutions to the needs for the fire service or for policing. But of course, there could be businesses that provide security services as well. We've talked a lot about condominiums. There are a lot of condominiums who have private security forces that work for them or corporate campuses or university campuses. So there are precedents out there for private security forces to serve a broad area. And a broader area than the city or metropolis, as we discussed before, is the region or what's probably more familiar as a state or a country. So the most characteristic features of the built environment at this level are large infrastructure projects that interconnect different metropolis regions. Of course, the most obvious example of this would be roads. I think we've already covered the roads enough in this episode. The point to make here is that the same principles apply whether it's at the scale of a city or over a larger area. It's just that more coordination is required for the larger project in order to get everything connected properly. Another type of interconnecting infrastructure would be something like an electricity network. 
or power that's generated in, in one region can be transmitted to another region where there's more demand for it and less generation. A lot of modern day electricity networks are provided by governments or are, are at least heavily subsidized by governments with easements and land grants and that sort of thing, if not owned outright by government entities such as local state governments or even some sort of federal board of electricity or whatever. However, it's not much of a stretch to imagine that an electricity network could develop without government intervention. Electricity is obviously something that's crucial and essential to human life these days, and it's hard to believe that someone would be obstructionist enough to prevent electricity from coming to their house or to their town. With electricity networks, you have a similar problem to roads, where you need to find pathways to bring the services to people's homes and businesses. With government roads, wires are generally run along the roadways, with maybe some high-tension power lines being run more directly across other property easements. So what this would mean in an anarchic society is that the roadways, which would be privately owned, would be a potential means of providing electricity to all the homes and businesses along each road. This might mean that there would be negotiations between the electricity companies and road owners or organizations that owned roads. And there could even be some payment either from the electricity provider to the road owner for use of their easement, or possibly even from the road owner to the electricity vendor to make living and developing businesses along their road more appealing. Right, so this is another example of a sort of alternative commercial model that might evolve under an anarchic society. In the last episode, we discussed how, at the level of the region, Wealth is often transferred between different metropolis areas or from, say, a city area to the farmland areas, and that this is often done by government force through subsidies or welfare programs or that sort of thing. However, the real wealth that gets transferred is in the form of these large infrastructure projects that provide people in remote areas with access to products and goods from the cities and vice versa. They provide people in the cities with the goods that are produced out in the more remote areas. And so one possible effect of this is that remote areas that aren't capable of competitively producing goods to provide to either a nearby city or other areas are less likely to be developed. Historically, especially in countries like America and Australia, where as these countries were developing as modern westernized nations, there were large areas of land that hadn't been previously developed. And in the early days, throughout the 1800s, There were a number of government programs to promote development of these lands and to try to get people to move out into these remote areas. So, of course, there were a lot of these areas that really weren't suitable for any sort of profitable production, which means that they might have been quickly used up and then the proprietors would move on to some other land further out. Uh, This is certainly something that happened in Australia where people would go and set up a farmstead somewhere. And since the soil in Australia isn't as rich as it is in other parts of the world, uh, there's a lot of salt in the ground and that sort of thing, they would essentially just use up whatever minerals were in the soil pretty quickly and then move on and get another grant to move to another parcel of land a bit further out. And so this is a way in which the government policies to develop the resources of the country, in fact, ended up depleting them. In the U.S., this process was a little bit different, I think. It wasn't so much that the government was encouraging people to move to certain areas. As the colonies grew and more settlers came, there was a continually increasing demand for farmlands. And over several decades, settlers just kept pushing west onto lands that they purchased from the government. But I think that demand was just there. I don't think it was necessarily encouraged by the government. There was some government promotion, especially in areas in the sort of northern Midwest, um, such as Minnesota and Wisconsin. Those areas are known for being heavily populated by people of ethnic, maybe Scandinavian or German backgrounds. There was actually a concerted sort of marketing campaign that happened, uh, I can't remember when it was, sometime around sort of the, uh, the late 1800s, I think. They specifically targeted people in Scandinavia and Germany and places like that and uh, told them how great and sunny and productive the northern Midwest was. Now, when they came over here, maybe I guess if you're from Norway, maybe Minnesota does look green and lush (laughs) and productive and warm. But um, I'm I'm guessing there there was more than a few people that were a little bit uh, disappointed once they they found out what what they were in for, (laughs) once that first snowstorm came. (laughs) 
Right. Okay. So I was thinking more about the colonial expansion or, or kind of post-colonial expansion in the early 1800s, uh, which we talked about in the introduction to episode two. Even though the government at that time wasn't necessarily promoting lands in the way you're describing, they had taken ownership of the lands and were selling them off and profiting from the sales to settlers. One potential consequence of the fact that the U.S. government owned and sold all of this land was that all of the land was seen as fit for development and farming rather than for preservation. One consequence of this was that the old growth or original forests in the eastern parts of the United States were almost entirely cleared to make way for farmland. So that nowadays, pretty much any tree you see in the eastern United States is new growth that happened sometime after the land had been cleared and farmed. In the previous episode, we discussed border controls and how different regions will restrict people from entering or leaving that area. Of course, in an anarchic society, the concept of a political region is not really a, a real thing. <laughs> the only real boundaries are boundaries between property owned by individuals or businesses or whatever. So you, don't, you wouldn't have this overarching boundary that would apply to everyone within a certain region. So that's not to say that you wouldn't have regions where a large group of people get together and agree to abide by certain laws or to share certain public services. You know, I can imagine a sign when you come into Massachusetts saying you're now entering Red Sox territory or something like that. And really, that's almost the same thing that we've discussed with a sort of a condo development, but on sort of a broader scale. I think it's unlikely that something that cohesive would develop over a very large area. You might get it over a certain metropolis region or something like that, you know, certain quirks or standards or whatever that developed there. But I, I don't think that would really propagate out too far just because people in different regions have different priorities and uh, different needs. Yeah, that's possible. Although one, I think one possibility which is something we touched on in the last episode, is that I think there would be a greater drive for more standardization that could really be global, where rather than having 50 state building codes, you might have one building code that is much more broadly adopted. And the reason that more people might choose to adopt this is that, is that it might be what's more acceptable to their insurance companies. Yeah, I agree, but I think the scope of that is still limited to particular applications. I don't think you're going to have a national identity built around, you know, ISO standard 8295 or whatever it is. Right, agree. This would be just for <laughs> specific things. Right. So I think when you start talking about immigration, it's almost kind of a meaningless concept once you get to this point where you don't actually have these defined national boundaries Really what you have is people who are moving from one piece of land to another piece of land or, or one property to another property. And so you don't have immigrants. You have either guests or trespassers, I guess. And so, of course, there are a number of reasons why people would allow others to come onto their property. You know, it could be a business who wants people to come and, and purchase things in their store. It could be a farm who wants people to come and help with the harvest. Or it could be any number of other applications where simply... Some people need help from other people and are willing to invite them onto their land to help out and are probably willing to pay them for their efforts. Yeah, you know, we, you hear all these statistics in the current system about how this state is doing better than that state economically or this country is doing better than this other country. And state and national governments often implement a variety of, of economic policies to try to make their region more competitive with other regions. But if you didn't have such a strong regional political identity, I don't think that you would see these kind of trade wars developing. Economic development would be more of a matter of, of individuals or, or individual businesses seeking out the best opportunities wherever they reside. And a group of individual businesses in a certain area might get together and decide that um, you know, they want to promote some event in their town to draw in tourists. You know, maybe all the all the restaurant owners and hotel owners in a certain city pitch in a bunch of money to put on some big event to attract tourists to the area. These days, that happens via the government, where the local government uses tax money to do that. However, they put forward all these slogans about all the, the great benefits that it will have for the city. However, the, the vast majority of people within that city 
don't see any benefits. I mean, when there's a, a car race here in Adelaide, which there, there happens to be on at the moment, the only benefit I see is that it takes me an extra 20 minutes to get into work in the morning. So I, you know, I get to spend more time listening to music in my car or whatever, instead of being at work. Or listening to this podcast over and over in your car. I only listen for the jokes. Only for the jokes. <laughs> you listen a long time for those. <laughs> Another example of, of what Joe is talking about is when state or local governments fund the construction of, let's say, a sports stadium or, or a convention center or something that will, again, try to draw people into their city and supposedly boost the economy of their city. But of course, in an anarchic society, this type of development would be funded by either the businesses who are establishing those facilities or if it's something like the NFL, you know, if let's say you have some small town where they want to put a team, but there's not enough people in the town to support the stadium, well, maybe then the NFL itself might provide some funds to build a stadium so that they can have more teams and broaden the fan base for the league as a whole. One thing that can create kind of a regional identity is language. So even if you don't have political borders, you would most likely still have regions where a specific language is predominant. That in and of itself might tend towards standardization of other things like legal systems or judicial systems where the laws and processes are developed specifically for that language and the culture that uses that language. And historically, the term nation really referred more to language groups and cultural groups than it did to modern nation states. If the kind of anarchism we're talking about spread throughout the globe, as Joe mentioned, you wouldn't have borders between nation states. If you think about the current political arrangements, there's really no global government that oversees what all of the other national governments do. You have the United Nations, but that's more of a convention than it is a government that's authorized to initiate force. So what this means is that in the current situation, really every nation is anarchic with respect to all the other nations. That's right. And somehow these different nations manage to come up with agreements, whether they're unilateral, bilateral, or whatever, where they can facilitate trade with each other. Every now and then they can avoid going to war with each other. Now, that's not to say that free trade agreements as they exist today are that beneficial. I mean, they're probably better than closed borders and all that stuff. But the problem with free trade agreements today is that they're really anti-free trade agreements because really all they do is enumerate a few exceptions to all the, the regime of tariffs and other prohibitions that exist within each nation. And they do so on a selective basis. So it's really just a modern implementation of 15th century mercantilism. That'll get people nodding their heads. <laughs> OMG, so true. <laughs> of course, this raises the obvious question or concern. Well, if all these nations are anarchic with respect to each other and anarchism is so great, then why do we still have so many wars between civilized nations? And of course the reason for this is that the people initiating and facilitating the wars are supporters of government, and specifically supporters of their own government which they want to have superiority over whatever other governments they're combating. Their militaries are not funded by, let's say, voluntary funds provided by people who support those wars or who support the policies that lead to those wars, they're funded by taxation or more specifically by borrowed money that is guaranteed by their ability to tax their own citizens. So you don't have a market process here facilitating war. The wars are funded by money taken by force. They're propagated by people who don't see force as a problem. And the people making the decisions to start the wars don't personally bear the consequences of their actions. So I think we can expect that in a truly anarchic society where, where militaries are not funded by money taken by force, war would be much less common. And if there ever were a war, it would most likely be for a just cause, or at least a cause that many people consider to be just. So in this episode, and really in the last three episodes, We've tried to introduce some of these ideas of anarchic solutions to societal problems. We haven't necessarily given all of these topics the, the level of detail that they deserve to make a strong case. These episodes were meant to be kind of an introduction to these concepts. And as we go along in this podcast, we're hoping to develop a lot of them 
in greater detail in future episodes. Some of these ideas that we're talking about, I think even we haven't fully sorted out. And so part of the the motivation for us to do this podcast is to really explore these ideas and see how far we can push them. In the introduction, we discussed how ants are capable of using decentralized means to form complex societies, construct elaborate ant hills, and shape their environment to their own needs. It seems that we should be able to do at least as good as the ants in coming up with decentralized and nonviolent solutions. We understand that a lot of these ideas are foreign to a lot of people, and we don't expect everybody to be on board with us right from the get-go. But we hope that we've given you at least some food for thought and maybe a new way to look at the world as you're traveling around your built environment. Mm-hmm.